It says I'm live, so I believe that I'm live right now. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. There's people, we're here. Uh, thank you guys for being here, here uh, on this Sunday afternoon. To talk about this incredible collection of short stories, what it means when a man falls from the sky by Leslie Nika Arima. I am joined, I said last I said last time these are two of my favorite people, but these are also two of my favorite people and I mean that for real. So I wanna bring Doreen St. Felix, brilliant phenom writer from the New Yorker. And I'm, an, I, sorry, and I'm an actually so who maybe wrote a book you've heard of. I think it's a, I think they call it a New York Times bestseller. Is that what they call it? I mean, you know, <laughs> is that, is that, is that the name? I, the book is literally called New York Times bestseller. So thank you for understanding. <laughs> thank you for understanding how SEO works. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of your next book. Yeah, who, like, I don't know how to tell you this. I am never writing another book. So <laughs> I will I will leave the book writing to people um, like uh, the woman who wrote this book uh, to keep writing. So wait, before we get into it, I just want to read, how how are we doing, guys? It's It's been... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> It's like those memes where you see, like the question is like, "Oh, how are you doing?" and the answer is good or something basic like that, but the photo is like from Midsummer. <laughs> I I saw a meme that was like a child yelling at God, and she said, "Like, just come out. I just want to talk. I just want to talk to you. Like, I'm not gonna do anything to you. Just just come out. I just want to talk." Oh, well, I would jump God right now for sure if that was. I I'm obsessed with that meme construction. That's like mentally, I'm here because every time I just think about the bleakest place that you could be, I'm like, that's where I already am. And so, I don't know, you guys, it's been it's been a tough summer, but um, you know, we're still here, we're still here. We're still here, we're, we're doing our best, we're reading some books. <laughs> um, okay, let's get into, let's talk about the book a little bit. Um, should I ask just like a really, dumb generic first question, which is just your favorite story in the book. Ooh. So I actually interviewed Arima mm -hmm. when we did, you know, she's doing like a book tour, tour yeah. now. And I think my favorite is probably the short story that she read from, which is Light. And that's the one about, you know, a little girl who's living with her dad um, and her mom is abroad, mm -hmm. however you might say it. And um, I just love, there's like a slight inversion of gender expectation in that story where you would expect like, oh, a little girl who's being raised by her father, like maybe she would be withdrawn or not be able to like really catch up actually it's her mother who is of course trying to protect her, but therefore extinguishing the light or the fire, which is, you know, so that I love that one because it's just it's really quiet. But she just does this thing with every story where it just kind of like cuts off at the end. Yeah. And I think that that the truncation is like very like tragic. She does. I mean, I think that's like one of the keys with like a short story. Like one of the things that makes short stories so difficult is like you have to enter the story like with so much already understood. Um, and I think she, one, she does that incredibly well, but you're right, but she ends them at this exact moment where I'm like, there, that's not an ending, but it is an ending. Uh, yeah. I, I think, I don't know, this question is, it's hard because I think that a thing this collection does so well is that so many of the stories are actually in conversation with each other and um, so I would say that mine are a tie between Wild, the one about like Ada and her cousin, you know, where they're like both really skeptical and then they find their common bond. And I find that that story and um, Light, the one where the father, you know, like talks about the spark in the girls and how the sparks gets extinguished. Those those are the two that to me, I, I think about like, I've read, I think I've read this collection, like this is the third time I've read it. And I still think about both of those because there's just something really um, 
I don't know, like I, I found like something very profound and that has really connected me to this moment in both of those stories. And so I would say that those those are the two that I keep coming back to over and over again. I I loved What is a Volcano? Like I'm a real sucker for like a kind of folklore uh, situation. But I also, I feel like I have my favorite story and then my favorite character who's glory be to God. Um, because I just love a rude black girl. Like, I just, <laughs> I, it, it's just so, you know, and I think this, this collection too has so many like poorly behaved black girls in a way that like we just so rarely get, um, or at least we rarely get them where they're being sort of treated at least by the, the author or the writer with like some degree of care and understanding. Yeah. Um, no more, no more. You, you're both rude black girls. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess it's just like making me think so much about, um, I don't think that I had fully like metabolized that because that so much of the experience of those girls is obviously something that I, I you know, and I, I think that hearing you say like, oh yeah, we don't really allow black characters to be this way. Like, I know that that's true emotionally, but I think that here I'm like, no, but that's how all black girls are. So <laughs> that's why it's hard, you know, like, it's hard to reconcile those two statements. But I don't know, I, I think that even in the, you know, in the in the misbehavior or in the, you know, that the, the girls are also very different, which is what I really appreciated about it. I was like, oh, everyone is messy in a different way. Everyone is their own person in a different way. But also I think that it, it always makes me feel that, you know, is it actually that these girls are like, complicated in a very in a particular kind of way or is it that we usually i don't know that we notice so much more when black characters are allowed to be fully three-dimensional you know right I'm like shouldn't we just write everyone with this level of complexity and so right. that's i don't know I, I don't have anything like super smart to say about it but i um i would defend like each and every one of their honors well that's why i love glory so much because i was like this shit is annoying. I was like, your parents sound terrible. You know, like some bad shit happened to you. This dude is kind of corny. Like, I'm like, I every frustration that she articulates, I'm like, that's very fair. I get why you're kind of salty, like a hundred percent. But I also think she probably married this dude at the end of the story. I think that she married him, but I also think that that's continuing to fulfill the curse, right? Like that's right. her, cause she can't, as her grandfather like makes it known, she can't make the right choice. Like, right. And I think one thing that I love about this collection and also like it we've done to past stories is like, you're firmly, you're not in this like assumed Western context, you know? And mm -hmm. so a lot of what we might experience as being like different from the norm or actually just like a another set of norms that like, right. was yeah. writing. Um, and the glory story is so good because it's like got this like very lofty conceit, which is like this first child born after six years of crime. But then it's also just like kind of like a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's at a job and she like meets this dude. She's like once I bother her, she's like, oh, like I'll marry him. Like I love <laughs> tears of, I guess you could say, Storytelling. Yeah. yeah, it is a lot. I mean, when I, I was also thinking too, like my brain has now been poisoned to like read something and think like, could this be a movie? Could this be a TV show? Um, and I, to me, the story that I most, I was like, oh, this is a movie is Windfall um, about the mother and the daughter where her mother is always like pulling these scams um, where her daughter is getting hurt. Um, and then, you know, I guess I'll spoil it. You've all read the book. Um, you know, she's the daughter, she's pregnant. She loses the baby at the end. And it's this like, like moment where her mom is like, good job because they're getting half a million dollars as a result of the accident. And I was like, oh, I want to watch this forever. Like hours I want to watch <laughs> because like there's so, there was just like so much to, you know, I mean, obviously all these stories, like so much to unpack in like such a short sort of period of time, but like, those characters to me, um, I was like, that's what I'm like, where my mind went with where we could go with those characters was just like all over the place. Um, 
Kara, I'm still dying at when you said that, you know, like, spoiler alert. I love the idea that someone is on this chat who has not read the book and is, like, incensed right now. They're like, uh, why are you spoilering book well, for me? you know, also, <laughs> my, my, my hottest of hot takes is that I think spoilers are good. Like, I don't mind yes. spoilers. Yes, um, I, I actively seek out spoilers. Anytime I want to watch a movie, I always, yeah. I'm like, where is the synopsis? Tell me everything that happens because I don't like surprises. But, you know, it's funny too that you're saying that your mind goes immediately to finding a somatic universe. I People who know me know that like one of my biggest shortcomings in life is that, well, I have a lot of them, but one of them is specifically that I struggle a lot with reading fiction. Like I read so much nonfiction and like when it comes to fiction, my, my brain is just like, I don't have the imagination. It's too, like, it, it's work. It's like emotional work in a way that I am too stupid to do. And, and I think that that's also, that's partly why I love short stories so much because the universe is contained. And then, you know, and then there are people like you who are like, oh, here's like 10,000 pages of the story goes. And I'm like, great. I was like, it was 70 pages. We're done. I don't have to, I don't have to like think about it more. But I think that a thing, the reason that like I love this collection so much is that I just like could not I could not remember for me the last time that I had read like this kind of experience that was specifically centered around blackness like I grew up in Nigeria I I recognize so much of the you know the like the parts of the story that are like more Americanized the parts of the story that are more Nigerian and I love like Jhumpa Lahiri's work so much and that is all about you know that's all about like a Bengali experience and it's still like good writing is good writing it always works and I realized that I had never really explored like actually stories centered around African people in this specific context. And I think that that made it so much more powerful for me because it it just really lays out the case where the black diaspora is vast and is big and also is connected through all of these ways. And that is something that the, the collection does so successfully. And so I, I don't know. So hearing you talk about, you know, hearing you talk about a cinematic universe for me, I'm just like, wow, like any of these stories, really, you could take somewhere else because they're stories that are so undertold. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's like a disservice to everyone because the stories are the stories are bomb. Yeah. I mean, that, that is part of like, my goal with this book club, too, is like, I think we like, we know that like, specifically, we're talking about black women, like, most of the books that I was told to read were not written by black women. And yet I was dropped. So I was dropped into worlds that I didn't understand, but I was able to understand in part because the writing is incredible or, you know, for whatever reason. And I think this collection, it's, you know, hopefully reminding people that like, I'm not Nigerian, you know what I mean? Like I may be black, but I'm not like, there were, there were things here that I was like, this doesn't, this isn't necessarily something I know, but the extent to which with storytelling and with good storytelling, you're dropped into a world and you can immediately understand it. And to not think that because this, these stories aren't about someone who you, you know, on the surface believe you can relate to the degree to which, like, if you just read it and give it a second, um, especially when they're in the hands of like a really incredible author, like just the way that like the world is opened up for you, which sounds very like corny, but like, I feel like. No, I it's not, it's not corny. It's not corny at all. It's just, it's the, it's the critique that always like gets at me. I'm like, we grew up watching like white people fall in love on screens. It still made me feel like love was possible. And so I'm like, why can't the reverse not be true? But that is not how, you know, that's usually not how that works. So, um, which endlessly fascinates me, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm down for this book, so. <laughs> Yeah, and I think also about the ways that Leslie uses magical realism and science, mm -hmm. and even some elements of straight up horror to yeah. us, like black women who feel like, oh my God, like I'm seeing myself I'm like, oh shit, like I'm not like a mathematician, like in the type, you know, um, story in the collection. So I think I'm so interested in her as a writer because she seems really private and furtive and like clearly has like a lot of like amazingly fucked up shit going on in her mind. Yeah. Um, and I just, I love the title story because like that to me feels like a movie treatment. Like that's like something like there to me, like you can see directly. Yeah. Um, I was thinking as I was sort of like remembering all the stories this morning, I think also 
in the wake of, of Chadwick Boseman's death, I was thinking about Black Panther and this sort of Afro-futurism, you know, that like that movie was was trying to do. And I thought of this story and like, also I think just the way that like with, it, I don't think it's only Black people, but with the way like we look to the future and the way there's still so much of this connection to the past and folklore with like, even our ideas of the future are still so heavily we reference the past in such a way, which I do think, you know, for obviously Wakanda is not a real place, but I think that- um, Debatable, you know. Kara, debatable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, should we just make it a place now? It's right next to Kenya. If you look on a map, it's right there. <laughs> I mean, what it means when a man falls from this, like the title story, that that takes place in Wakanda. It's just Black Panther hadn't come out yet. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, that's real. That's real. I, I don't know, Doreen said something earlier too, you know, how the, like the book just like shifts all these, you know, it just like shifts genres all the time. And, and I think I, I really enjoy that. I enjoy that there's like an element of magical realism. I enjoy that there's an element of horror. I just, and I think that that takes, like, that's a very deft kind of skill where she can just bring that into every story. And it makes it, it makes it such a much more like dynamic reading experience, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just, I don't know. I think also we all grew up with like this specific kind of folklore, like across our different diasporas. But having that there just, you know, it just like ties it back in. And so it's why for as much as I like, you know, I rolled my eyes at a lot of um, Black Panther I still left feeling like incredibly uplifted and having had a good experience because who doesn't want to see like even the tiniest part of their culture, you know, like reflected back to them in a way that feels in a way that feels powerful. And in a way that feels like, I think that's the thing about that title story where it's like when she said, how many black mathematicians have we seen <laughs> on anywhere? You know what I mean? And like, they do exist, but like just like that sort of expansion of, I mean, it's like the imagination that we possess for ourselves, um, I think in just all of the things we know and imagine ourselves can be like, I don't know, I think using, you know, things like sci-fi and magical realism to like really kind of stretch this, um, you know, black imagination for readers, not necessarily for us, but like that, that's one of the reasons I love magical realism so much, just because I, um, I think one, I just love the way you have to write it. Um, but I think like the, the sort of the ways that we can imagine ourselves um, beyond just the, you know, the stories that actually happen to us, like that's always just what I want, because it's also just like fun, you know, and it's and it's what goes on in like our imaginations, but we so rarely get to have that really reflected out beyond our own minds. And I think there's this thing that you can do, like once you assume that the black imagination is your default, like that's your foundation, then you get to do things like creating vagueness and ambivalence, which is something that I love in her story. You know, like even um, with Wild, we begin like identifying this American girl who's breaking all these norms and that's why she has to go back home. And the girl that she felt like she had to revere ends up also being like, a, you know, a fucked up in mm -hmm. Or even um, I think with the title story, it's a story about colonization. Mm -hmm. And it's not only Europeans colonizing people who were formerly known as Africans. So I also, like, I just, like, really am so animated by Black writers who are willing to go to a place where Black is not um, immediately related to, like, benevolence or innocence, where they're, like, ready to engage the possibility of failure, discord, um, meanness. And I think that, like, she's, like, always there, you know? Like, the characters are, like, actually very, very like, together, but in a way that is less than taking care of allowing us to like go to like slightly more heavy. Yeah. 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 You know, and it's like the way that she lays out so much of, you know, the background of all the, the Nigerian stuff that's happening. It's like from the Biafra war straight into like the party scene. It's just, there's just this line of 
we have our own history. We have our own conflicts. We have our, we have our own problems that are you know sometimes like divorced from from colonialism. But I think that the yeah the historical trauma is very much like in the background of all of the stories, and I think informs so many of the choices that people are making across generations. And I was just like really particularly impressed with with that, where I was like, okay, if if this is if this is something that you even have passing knowledge of then you kind of get it. And even if you don't, you really start to see, you start to see the contours of what makes like Nigerian society, Nigerian society, and what were, you know, like some of these high watermarks of, um, of like what Nigerian imagination really can be for, for, um, for itself. And I was just, I just, I just keep thinking about that a lot. Well, you know, so she's, she's a good writer. What can I say? She's a good writer. Good. There's like, I just read it before this. I read a book that I hated. And so reading this again was, oh, thank God, well, like bring me back to something I like. I, I mean, like, I mean, for you as someone who, like you said, lived in Nigeria, like, I'm wondering what, I mean, it's like a hard question, but like for this sort of the diasporic, uh, I mean, we've had this conversation about like African Americans and 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 Africans and like the way that uh, I mean the way that the story you know like I'd say it's probably like a seventy thirty of of the book of where the stories yeah. take place um, and so I guess I'm just wondering like this 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 depiction of this sort of specific Nigerian experience um, just like how that was for you reading the book. Honestly, it worked so well for me because and because I think that in every story there is a slight shift. Like the 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 diaspora wars are raging and they're very vast and um people can be incredibly cruel to each other across this like weird shit. But I think that one thing one thing that like worked really well for me in this book, and it's why I brought back, you know, Jumpa Lahir a while back, is that you're like, oh everyone's experience is different because of like random family shit that just happens to you. Like an uncle moves to New Jersey and everyone has to come along or like, you know, or you're, you're just a kid. But I think that within the African diaspora, there is definitely a divide where, you know, it matters how old you were when you came to America. Mm -hmm. It really does matter. And it matters like what the context it is that you came in. And with her, without having like, I, I like had not like looked up her own specific family history until after I read it. And I was really, I was, I was really heartened actually that she was able to write from so many different perspectives. And for me, like someone who I'm like, I am like, I'm an African person who like grew up in Africa. I, I have no beef with, uh, with my, my, my other global blacks. Um, <laughs> I just... I, I really like I loved it so much because I think that she she really just like captures the how like citizenship is such a fucking weird crapshoot. It really is like it makes no sense. It's not something that you earn. Like weird forces in the universe conspire for like the, with the forces of migration to do these things. And I thought that she did that really well. And and most of the people that I have talked about this book with are like other African people who can be really skeptical of this kind of writing. And I think that the consensus is that it really, really, really works. And I think that part of why it works is because it's stories, you know, and there's an opportunity to do something different um, in every single narrative as opposed to, you know, like if it were a novel or if it was something else. So I don't know. I'm like 10 out of 10 knocked it out of the park. I really appreciated it. Were you guys say something, Jared? I was just thinking about how in Western depiction, African capital A air quotes. I'm you know, <laughs> of African stories as we call them, there's often this like knee jerk um, instinct to make the story epic and really big and have it span everything and have it fulfill the pockets of emptiness that diasporic black Americans have, you know. Yeah. Like um the dash between African American that's doing a lot there. It's doing a lot of work. And I think um, I love just the tightness of the small space and the idea of I have, I want to tell a fable about the difficulty of having children. And we do it through this like incredible conceit of women crafting their babies with blood or yarn 
in that sense. And I think that uh, for writers of all genres and all media, it's really tempting to tell like the biggest story first. But I think when you can like really like, the details and telling a story in seven pages is like to me it's a miracle. And yeah. The fact that she is able to do it as often as she does in this book, like really ten out of ten. Um, I think it's a mark of brevity is a mark of writers that I really look at. I mean, that is like this idea of like epics, like it's like you think of um, I mean, it's like my, my, which I'll probably say this every time, but it's like my issue with like sort of slave movies and it like, it's meant to feel so big as if most of those experiences weren't just like on a very, like tell a movie about slaves. That's literally just about like two people living their lives under the oppression of slavery, as opposed to about like the entire, like every story is about the entire structure as opposed to just like, like tell a story about slaves where we don't ever see the white person because they probably would go a long days without necessarily seeing the master. You know what I mean? Like they're just, they're out doing their shit. And I think it is, you know, but I how think- will the, How will the white people have aha moments if uh, we don't have right? How will they learn if you don't put uh, the, um, those people in the movie, Kara? I'm How are white people going to think I would have been the nice slave owner <laughs> if we don't, if we don't put the Brad Pitt in the movie? Right. Um, who, like, who's going to drive the green mobile? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so well. No, but I, like, listen, I, I so agree with that. Like, the, the making it tighter, the making it smaller, because in the end, it, it just, it makes it, I, I think that you're right. Like the epicness to me feels always so forced and also lacks so much intimacy. Like what I really want to see is these intimate spaces. And in this collection, the like the mother daughter dynamics, like a dynamic that is over explored, like to the point of cliche, um, this, you know, I'm like, there is such a freshness here because the stories are so hyper specific. The only way that you can make something feel really deeply relevant and feel new is to really ground it in specificity. And I think that because the stories are so tightly contained, you are moved every single time, you know? And um, I don't know that that is, that's like, where, that's what I'm thinking about from like the last thing that you just said. Well, you mentioned mother daughters, but I want to ask about the men in these stories. Although, although they're somewhat infrequent, um, I like, there were, there's like three depict, there's three like descriptions of men that I want to read because I was obsessed with them. Um, so the first is in The Future Looks Good. Um, Godwin was so unused to hearing no, it hits him like a wave of acid, dissolving the superficial decency of a person who always gets his way. So we got one terrible man. In um, Bucci's Girls, because the consequences of disrespecting a man like Dixon are always disproportionate to the sin. Which like, oh, I love that. And then my favorite was in What is a Volcano? No one asked Aunt Woody thought of River, but someone should have known that you do not take small things from small men. Which was like, I, re I was like, I almost threw the book across the room. Like, <laughs> not take small things from small men is like, so both, it like, counterintuitive and just like the truest thing I've ever read. Real shit, real just shit, real shit. He, and I think that's what I find interesting in these, the way that these, the men in the book who are bad are like bad isn't, it's because they're so small. Like it's not like they're evil. They're not like villains. They're not, you know, like overlords that are out, you know, just like scheming to ruin women's lives. They're just very small people. And the way that like a really small, insecure man, just the <laughs> the destruction that they can cause is like, <laughs> it's just like hit me a little too hard in, on this particular day of 2020. I know, but you know, but at the same time, it's like, it's almost like they don't, like, they're acknowledged, but they don't really exist, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. it's that in the in the last paragraph of the book, it's the one that always like hits me, I literally I wrote it down where she says, 
because it's 100% the thesis statement of the entire book where she says, girls with fire in their bellies will be forced to drink from a well of corrections till the flames die out. And I was like, you know, like, who's doing that? The men, but like, you know, again, not, not really acknowledged, not relevant to the narrative. And I just love this idea of, you know, that the main character in that last story who just refuses to be corrected, which right. is supposed to be like an aberration. And actually I'm like, I am rooting for you. Like never change, do not bend to the will of, you know, of society. And, and so when I think about, when I think about how small those male characters are, it's that again, where every conflict technically should revolve around them, but they're almost never acknowledged in the story. And that feels, I'm like, this is great. Like no men in the movie version of this. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think, and it's not just with the men, I think that the way class gets brought up is like really mm. deftly done and like deeply threaded through the story. Thinking about a character like Lawrence, you know, who's the help. And he ends up actually being family to these yeah. girls who have been orphaned by the death of their father and their mother, of course. And I think like, it's just done with the lightest touch, but often I think in choosing like, even though there's not a lot of men in these stories, the ways that they're different from each other and what that has to say about, you know, the class that they come from, the way that they've chosen to live their lives, I think it's like, it's so important that that's done because then we don't walk away being like, you know, making generalizations about. Yeah. And as opposed to generalizations about the year. It's one of the things that I actually really love in stories, like African stories, because I think in the United States with class and black people here, it's a little, it's a little trickier. Like we don't, yeah. there's just, there is not, it's not a nation of all black people in the way that, you know, when you're in Nigeria or another, you know, in Kenya, another African country. And it's why I love those stories because you can get into class between black people yeah. in a way you, just, you can't do it the same way if you're talking about black Americans. And like, I just, I love that there's room for that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's more room for that in stories that are set in African countries. Um, you know, like those are really the only, it's like the only place you can really, really tell these story, these class based stories about black people. I think. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I think it's true. You're right that the juxtaposition is there, but I think that as someone who is not African-American here, I notice actually that like there, there is so much that goes unsaid about class between um, black people in the United States. And, but I think that you're right. Like the reason that it happens is like very structural, but I really wish we would see more stories about that. You know, it's like even, I, yeah, I'm just like, uh, all, all of the, the, yeah, I'm like the, the Martha's Vineyard's blacks. I'm like, someone tell me more about them. You know, like what's going on here? The like, uh, these like rich black families in the Pacific Northwest. I, I want to know more, but I, yeah, I think. Who, who are the, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Who Listen, every time I meet, like there's a certain kind of black family that I meet that I'm always like, where is all this money coming from that no one will tell me? But again, I'm like, I'm coming at this from a foreigner perspective and so, I think that, yeah, African society discusses class all the time because there is so much poverty. So it's e it's just like easier to see. You're like, well, right. if you're poor, you're not. And if you're not, here are all of the levels of it. But here it's, yeah, it's so much harder. And it's also a more, um, it's a way more fraught conversation to be had. Yes. And, you know, but it, it it is also because people don't literally have domestic workers living in their homes. So, you know, I'm like, the contrast is so much easier when you are um, when you are not here. Have you not seen the Inkwell, Amina? No, I have not. What's the Inkwell? That, that's about some Martha's Vineyard Negroes. Okay, um, putting it on the list. There's a, there's a terrible book. It's not. It's terrible, not for other reasons, but um, terrible our, good, terrible good, or terrible bad. I don't. Doreen, have you read our kind of people? No, I was going to bring up Margot Jefferson, but Mar. I yes. I, I liked. I liked her book. I think our kind of people is like this guy who I think later was like, oh, I just realized my kids are gonna be treated different. Like he said something psychotic, <laughs> like after the fact, like, oh, my kids grew up around white people and but they're gonna experience racism. It's like, yeah. Um, but our kind of people really gets into like the history of like Jack and Jill 
um, the links, um, and like all of those, like the black high society world. I think from the title, calling something our kind of people tells you a lot about the author and who considers himself one of those people, which is why I found that book a little difficult. I think um, Negro Land is a much better, like, because it's it's written by someone with self-awareness, um, unlike this other book, but. That's, um, a, um, that's a shelf I wish they had at the library, written by someone with self-awareness, and then they're just like, <laughs> <laughs> like, does this person know what they're doing? Um, I, I have a question I want to ask you guys about um, about like more like about the craft of the book because my so Kara you mentioned that like Windfall is your favorite story I loved Windfall specifically because she writes it in the second person mm -hmm. which is so I'm like wow you're writing about a scammer in the second person this is <laughs> beautiful to me and so I'm just like really curious what other um, you know, like what other things like that you notice that you really, that you appreciate? Well, I think a lot about her sentences. Her sentences remind me of Jamaica Kincaid. Mm. Like very unruly sentences. After you read it, you're like, what just happened? You have to go back and read them again. <laughs> because a world just happened actually in the expanse of four lines. And I think that it's very tricky to master because like, it can come off as being indulgent or confusing or poor writing. Mm -hmm. To me, it's evidence of like, she's clearly a widower. She clearly is like an editor. She clearly, you have to have so much in order to like trim the fat so that you can to make these sentences that sometimes are not even linear. Like, I think that mm -hmm. the cultural, her cultural, where she's coming from is like, literally embedded in the language. I think to do that while writing in English is like very, uh, it's very difficult to do without it feeling good. And yeah. I mean, the, I, like Doreen was saying earlier, like I can never write short stories. Like it, because I, I don't have the, I don't have the patience to like Edit and edit and edit and edit and edit. Like I find the editing process as much as you. And like you know what I mean to just to get to where you would have to get to with a short story. Like I think the first story, the future looks good, is like such an incredible example of like how little we see and how much we understand. And it's just like to be able to craft sentences that are saying. 10 different things in one sentence is like, it just, it's like the type of writing I read and it's not like, listen, I know I'm a good writer, whatever, but I read that and I'm like, oh, I can't do that. You know, and in not like, not in a, <laughs> not in a way that I feel like, you know, I'm not good at something, but I'm like, oh, that's like a, that's a skill that is a, a specific skill that someone mm -hmm. has. And I think it is so apparent in this book that she, just has that capacity um, in a really incredible way. And like, I, I love to read things that I know I could never write. Yeah. Um, I think that that's, you know, it's not, and like, look, it's not like I pick up every book and I'm like, I could do this, but I'm like, I don't know. Like there's, I could tell a story to some extent and there are things where it's just like, I could, I would, could never arrive at this. I could never ever arrive at this. And I think, um, you know, just the first line of every single one of her stories, like the idea of like what it took to get to that for, you know what I mean? Just like the first line of those is like crazy to me. Um, and sounds very difficult. Yeah, yeah, one of my favorite metaphors, or yeah, I think it's a metaphor <laughs> to describe the writing process um, is the idea that like what you read, the sentence, the paragraph, the essay, the story, is the tip of the iceberg. And there's so much work yeah. being done underneath it and buttressing it. And the fact that you don't feel it, that's like where the outcome is. And it's so hard. Like, you know when you write something, you're like, this is like labory. Like if mm -hmm. someone were to read this, they'd be like, oh, she's like trying really hard. Like clearly, open with the source here, you know, like 
had Toni Morrison open next to her over there. Like it just feels <laughs> not like it's derivative. Like it's not coming from its own original place. Um, and I just really appreciate, you know, short. Some people think that short stories are easy to read or like they're easy to write. It's like, it's what? All. It's Do good. people think that? That's insane. Yeah. Or it's, or because you know I like work on fiction writer Twitter sometimes. They, a lot of fiction writers um, feel like the prestige of the short story, you know, in this era in publishing where like you have to publish the long book, you have to publish the epic or whatever, you know, there's this idea that like, if you're running an excerpt of a longer novel in a magazine, you can just call it a short story. And that's like very offensive to writers of short stories because the whole thing is about form and containment. You can't just excise something and then yeah. decide that it's this other form, like retroactive. Right, and, and like not to be super cheesy about it, but like when Kara was saying, you know, like that's something that I can't do. I was like, I, yeah, I was like, I can't do that because just the, that image that you just conjured, Doreen, of the iceberg, I was like, part of it too is that I literally cannot think of that story. I was like, there is not, like, I was like, I literally cannot, this would never come out of my brain. And so not to be cheesy about it, but it's really this, this, I, you know, there are certain stories that only certain people can tell and they have to have like all of that training and discipline with them in order to tell it in this, in this way. And I think that, yeah, it's like, it's why when a short story is good, like it hits you like a fucking ton of bricks because there's so much like economy of words and, you know, I, that like all coalesce to just to, to make this like, it feels epic and it's actually very small. So I don't know. I mean, anything I read and I, like I said, and I get angry, it's like my favorite. It's, it's my, it just is in, infuriating me. And I, I, I love, I love that reading experience. I know I had that when I read um, Carmen Maria Machado in the Dream House the first time. Like at the end of it, I just threw the book out. Of, like I was reading it, and I was like, I was like that Antonio Banderas gift where he's just like, like he just starts losing his mind, and I just threw the book across the room. I was like, this is too good. I am furious, and I'm walking away. And I like, I love feeling like that about reading something because. I think that it, it means that you're appreciating the story and the technique at the same time. And you're like, thank you for both of those things. Yeah. And I mean, and again, like to have that from a black, like a black author getting the room for that is always mm -hmm. just like, it's just, it's just all I want guys. <laughs> Return. <laughs> I'm not asking a lot. I don't think <laughs> it, it feels, it feels right like now. <laughs> what I said you'd be surprised you're like I know <laughs> I know I know it's I don't know I I I was thinking like again like not to keep bring this up again because it's like a bummer but I was I was thinking a lot about Chadwick Boseman and how he was like his career was like other than Black Panther defined by you know playing James Brown and biopics and, and, and Jackie Robinson. And I think he played Thurgood Marshall also. He like, did. First of all, I saw that movie in the theater. He did play Thurgood Marshall. Um, was it like, I don't know what that is. I haven't been to one in eight months. <laughs> remember, remember cinema? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I think I, I think I, I used to have less kind of, um, I mean, like I said, I, I, I have problems where it's only like, you can only make a movie if this black person was like the best at the thing that they did once. Um, like that's the only time we're allowed to make big movies about black people. But I don't know, I think it's, um, so I used to I used to have a much more sort of like cynical look at it. And then I think mm -hmm. reflecting like in the last day about him and the choices that he made, like it really just being about black artists having, cause it's like, I was, when I more, I was like, oh, he, that's very much what he wanted. You right. know, like it wasn't just like yeah. this, you know, like I think he made very deliberate efforts to, you know, to play those roles and just wanting that, um, that opportunity for like black creatives um, and all creatives of color to like really, it's, it's so stupid, but like, just like make the work that they want to make. Like it made, it made me look at those movies very differently and have, 
more appreciation for them because it wasn't just like, oh, this is, you know, they're just making Chadwick Boseman play every incredible black man who ever lived. But as opposed to like, that was very specifically, those were the very specific stories that he wanted to tell. And that was like the line he was trying to walk with his career makes me, when, when I know that I'm like, okay, that's, that context is really important to me and always feeling like black writers and creatives are just getting to do the, the work that they want to do. Um, it, I don't know, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm then like, okay, this is something I love, but like, I, I feel like I can appreciate it and discuss it in the same way that like you kind of can unpack um, shit that we talk about that white people make, like all the shit that they get to make. Right, I'm just like, do white people, do you think white people sit around and like have these like caucuses about whether, you know, like what kind of stories they're allowed to tell or what's a cheesy <laughs> life story? What's a, you know, I'm like, white people definitely should because some of the shit is bad. But what I, but you know, but I, I just, like just hearing you say that about Chadwick Boseman, I, I, you know, and reading this collection, I think that I just want to get to a place where every, every person who wants to tell a story should have the same resources to tell that story, you know? And then it's like, let the marketplace of ideas decide for the thing, but like on the level of just like craft and what we, what like as creative people we would like to make, I, um, I appreciate, you know, like, black artist who wants to make things that you know don't have to fit this like very public narrative it's like you want to make you want to make small stories go for it you want to make like you want to tell like african folklore in a non like cheesy fucking way go for it you you know like i just that that is why i i know that it's like so fucking cheesy to talk about like representation and all of those things but when when i think about that it really is like can every black person who wants to do their work can they just have an opportunity to do that like i don't care that they're you know like a hollywood actor or that you know they want to make like 17 more slave movies i'm like god bless you if that's what you want to do but i want like for those of us who do not want to do that is there a place for our work to exist you know, and is there a place for us to like make that work at all? And and I I just like I really hope I really hope that that is true. Yeah, that's like I feel like we may not top that, Amina. I mean, what can I say? What can is I say? that is that our that is that our mic drop? I feel like it. I like. Yes. I mean, I think this book is such a perfect example of us getting to tell the stories that we want to tell in the way that we want to tell them. And it's probably why it like, when I first read it, you know, you're like, Oh, this was, you made the thing you wanted to make. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not always, there's one specific example that I will not say of a black person getting to make exactly what they wanted to make, but it not turning out, <laughs> but I, I won't drag them. But <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. So are you gonna message us after and tell us? I mean, I literally I think I saw like seven people flash in front of my eyes. I know. Like, like I'm like I'm like, please confirm or deny when I text you like who you're thinking about. I'll tell you. I'll give you three guesses and then I'll tell you. Um Here, so here's the thing here's the thing about that though. The reason that I feel like it really shouldn't like bother us is because at the end of the day, the reason that I firmly believe that we have like mediocre black work, if you can call it mediocre black work, is because the gatekeepers are still white and they make bad decisions about what should be made or not. And so like that is the system that really has to be dismantled in order for everyone to like get to do the shit that they want to do. So yeah. if you are. It's okay for some work to be mediocre. I, I agree. And and I don't even mean that in the extremely cynical like black mediocrity is revolutionary thing. Like I don't subscribe to that. However, I do think that taste is not unilateral. There are sometimes yeah. you to be very highly intellectually stimulated. You go to Criterion and you watch. I mean, we just read the article. They don't have that many black movies there. But. You know, I know, but they but they have that bad Ben Affleck, um, like Liv Tyler's dad movie. That's on Criterion. What's that called? Um, that, Arm Armageddon is on Criterion. Oh, yes. oh, I couldn't yes. even finish it. It's not like how you describe it. Ben Affleck and Liv Tyler's dad. Ben Affleck, Liv Tyler's dad. I don't have time for like that kind of caucasity, but that is on Criterion. Oh. But, but that's what I mean. It's like. 
that can be on Criterion because there's a like a tacit acceptance that like that movie is important. Whether or not it's a great movie is kind of beside the point. And so I don't know. Like I just watched Think Like a Man a couple of months ago. You know what? It made me cry. Like that, yeah. that movie made me cry. And it also just like made me feel it was like eating a hamburger. Sometimes yeah. you want a play mignon, sometimes you want a hamburger. And like I'm gonna tell you this, I always want a hamburger, not for like now. So <laughs> I I am fully satisfied. I am fully satisfied with the cultural offerings of this moment. <laughs> Unlike you, highbrow bitches, I am fine. Satisfied with the cultural offerings of this moment is an incredible quote. You know what? You go. You go get your hamburger. You go hit up. Is it? Is there a think like a man too, or just one? I believe. I believe there is. I think. I want to right after double feature. <laughs> um, in my house, in my house, growing up, whenever we watched double features, we called them American Movie Day because uh, we like that was never an opportunity that we had, and we would just like watch three movies in a row and be like, "I'm having an American Movie Day." So today, I'm going to try to have an American Movie Day with Think Like a Man, Think Like a Man Two, and I'm going to find another uh, a third one to round that. Why don't you try to throw in there uh, the whatever the sequel, The Best Man Holiday, the sequel. Oh, I saw I saw that on Court Street, and I I own. Uh, I, I own cried in that movie when I was like, "She has cancer!" <laughs> like I was, they got me, even though it that plot twist was clear from the beginning of the movie. Because she coughs. She yeah. Has- yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> you're you're literally talking. You're literally talking to someone who has seen the entire Tyler Perry body of work, like all of it in its entirety, including the television shows. <laughs> So let me tell you, some of it is good, some of it is less good, but um, it'll all make you think. (laughs) (laughs) We got to go out on Tyler Perry because there's nowhere to go from there. (laughs) (laughs) If if your guest next month don't mention Tyler Perry, don't mention Tyler Perry, just bring us back. (laughs) Um, Doreen and Amina, thank you guys for being here and reading the book. You and guys chat. are the best. And I love you both. And thanks thanks for joining us, guys. Bye, y'all. Thank you.